So good evening, and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm Mary Cranston. I'm the retired CEO and Chair Emeritus of the Pillsbury Law Firm, past chair of the club here, and uh, your moderator for today's program. Uh, you can find the Commonwealth Club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on the club's YouTube channel. And it is now my very great pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, Jeff Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center. He's also a professor at George Washington University Law School and author of the new book, William Howard Taft, which is part of the American Presidents series. And I read that book and I highly recommend it. It's excellent. Um, with the retirement of Justice Anthony Kennedy and the appointment of Brett Kavanaugh, the Supreme Court is at a turning point. And, uh, from privacy and free speech to affirmative action and immigration and presidential powers. All of these things uh, will be before the court. And interesting questions arise as to how the court will and the Constitution will change as a result of all this. And so today, uh, which is ironically the day after the midterms elections and the day after uh, Jeff Sessions was relieved of his office as Attorney General, we're going to be looking to Jeff to examine some of the most hotly contested constitutional questions of our time and what they might bode for the future of the country. As the CEO of the National Constitution Center, uh, Professor Rosen presides over a nonpartisan organization established by Congress as the first and only institution in America to disseminate information about the Constitution in order to increase the understanding of the American people. And what could be more important than that today? The Los Angeles Times called Professor Rosen the nation's most widely read and influential legal commentator. He remains a contributing editor of The Atlantic. <laughs> that was my mom, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Her, too. Yes. His essays and commentaries have uh, appeared in The New York Times, um, on National Public Radio, in The New Republic, where he was the legal affairs editor, and in The New Yorker, where he was a staff writer. Professor Rosen is a graduate of Harvard College, Oxford University, and Yale Law School. Please welcome Jeff Rosen. Thank you so much. So you speak. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mary, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks to the Commonwealth Club for arranging the flipping of the house and the firing of the Attorney General. <laughs> to ensure that we can have a conversation about this crucial, central issue facing the country. Are we on the verge of a constitutional crisis? And if so, will the Constitution survive? And I want to have this important conversation at this very significant time in a nonpartisan spirit. And whenever I teach constitutional law, I have a simple rule. And it's the same rule that we insist on in all of our programs at the National Constitution Center. And that is this one. I want you to set aside your political and your constitutional views. In other words, I want you to ask not whether you think it would be a good idea for Congress to investigate the president if he fired the attorney general, but whether the Constitution would allow it. And you might reach a different conclusion. You might say it's a great idea, but the Constitution forbids the investigation. Or you might say it's a terrible idea, but the Constitution allows it. And by engaging in that act of constitutional faith, you're doing just what justices on the Supreme Court are supposed to do. And that way, we can reason through together the incredibly vexing, complicated, and novel constitutional questions that this country will be facing over the next two years and beyond. This spirit of separating political and constitutional views is the one that brought me here tonight. It was uh, Maury Jane Perry who set into motion the introductions that, that brought me here. And she found the Constitution Center because she and her husband, Mark, listened to our We the People podcast, where every week I get to call up the leading liberal and conservative scholars in the country to ask them about the constitutional issues facing the country. So next week, we're going to discuss this question, which until this morning wasn't even on the radar screen. Can Congress investigate the president and compel testimony by him and his deputies uh, in the event of a disagreement about an investigation. 
It turns out that the last precedent on that question was from the 1920s in the Teapot Dome scandal. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm going to educate myself next week about it, and our We the People listeners will be educated too. And it's just a constitutional feast every week to take the issue in the news, to bring together the leading liberal and conservative scholars, and to learn together. Isaiah, the prophet, said, come let us reason together. That was the great quotation that my hero, Justice Louis Brandeis, embraced, and I want us to reason together tonight. The other educational platform that I must recommend to you to set the stage for our conversation is the National Constitution Center's Interactive Constitution. It's this amazing online tool that I want you to download, not now because I'm speaking, but <laughs> after the show. And we brought together the leading liberal and conservative scholars in the country to write about every clause of the Constitution, describing what they agree about and what they disagree about. It's gotten 20 million hits since we launched it. The College Board is going to push it out to every AP student in the country. And you, you must learn from it and download it so that you can have an informed opinion about the issues facing the country. All right, so this is an important time. And in 20 minutes, I want to intensely and as efficiently as possible, try to analyze the situation that we're in. How did we get here? What would the framers think about the state of our Constitution and democracy today? And how will the Constitution guide us over the conflicts that we may see on the horizon between the House and the President? And how will the Supreme Court react? Okay, let's step back and let's compose ourselves and let us <laughs> channel the thoughts of the father of the Constitution, James Madison. So James Madison came to Philadelphia in 1787 with Athens on his mind. Thomas Jefferson had sent him a trunk of books from Paris about the failed democracies of Greece and Rome. Madison came, became convinced from his reading that direct democracies led inevitably to demagogues and the mob. He said in Federalist 55, in all large assemblies of any character composed, passion never fails to wrest the scepter from reason. Even if every Athenian had been Socrates, Athens would still have been a mob. He's thinking of the 6,000 person assembly in Athens where uh, Cleon, the demagogue, had seized control of the masses and precipitated the Peloponnesian War. And based on the failure of Athenian democracy, Madison and his fellow framers became convinced that direct democracy led to demagogues and the triumph of passion rather than reason, of pathos rather than logos. They set up the entire constitutional system to filter popular passions so that reason could prevail. They were not opposed to majority rule, but they wanted to slow down deliberation so that reasoned majorities could form and that passionate mobs or factions would dissipate before they could do d damage. Madison and Federalist 10 defines a faction as any group, whether a majority or a minority, animated by passion rather than reason, dedicated to self-interest rather than the public good. And Madison is convinced that pa factions or mobs arise when there's no time for deliberation. He has in mind Shays' Rebellion, where groups of <laughs> debtors uh, rise up and repudiate their debts uh, to the expense of creditors. So the whole constitutional system of checks and balances and separation of powers is designed first to create not a direct democracy, but a representative republic where wise representatives of the people will engage in sober deliberation that will check popular passions. <laughs> I, I, you know, this is like a constitutional vaudeville here, just to describe, <laughs> to describe the, the framers' vision. And Madison is convinced that the extended size of the American Republic will make it hard for mobs or factions to discover each other. Communications is difficult. You can have face-to-face -face mobs, but before they can do any damage, they'll you know, get drunk and go home. And therefore, he's convinced that ultimately we will be guided by passion. Madison is not a media Luddite. And he's excited by the growth of a new mass communication technology, namely the broadside press, in which the Federalist Papers are published. And at the National Constitution Center, we have the first public printing
drawing of the US Constitution. It's in the Pennsylvania Packet newspaper. It was for sale for four pence on September 19th, two days after the Constitution was printed. It's incredibly moving to see this newspaper with no ads, a letter from George Washington saying, please read and debate this Constitution, and the Constitution printed on both sides. And Madison thinks that this broadside press will allow an enlightened class of journalists that he calls the literati to slowly enlighten the people and allow reason to prevail. It's kind of a group of 18th century David Brookses, basically, uh, <laughs> who are supposed to guide popular opinion. Uh, so that's the media for Madison. And then there are all of the elaborate counter-majoritarian features of the US Constitution from the Electoral College, which was supposed to be a group of wise solons who would choose the presidents of the highest character, the indirect election of senators, the uh, fact that each state had two representatives in the Senate, allowing the senatorial saucer, as George Washington put it, to cool the populist passions of the House, and a presidency removed from the people allowed to suggest legislation but not to lobby openly for it. It was a recipe for reason in the Enlightenment spirit. Friends, as I've described this, and your chuckles suggest, we have come very far from Madison's vision and are living to some degree in a dystopian Madison nightmare. <laughs> Let us think, and I say that in a completely nonpartisan spirit. <laughs> a president, let's begin with Congress. The Congress, which Madison feared would be the impetuous vortex sucking all uh, power into its tentacles, has become polarized to a degree that Madison could not anticipate it. The greatest failure of the founders was their failure to anticipate the rise of political parties. And the election of 1800, which led to the growth of the Republican Democratic Party against the Federalist Party, uh, began the growth of a party system that uh, Madison and Hamilton had not anticipated. But the first parties performed an unexpectedly cooling and aggregating function. They were devoted to constitutional principles rather than to personalities. And uh, d under the guise of the nationalist uh, the Federalist, the Hamiltonian Party, which favored broad national power of the economy against the Jeffersonian uh, Democratic Republicans who preferred states' rights and constrained governmental power, they amalgamated regional and economic interests in a way that uh, cooled passions to a large degree until the decline of the parties uh, relatively recently, really in the 1970s. The other thing that has exacerbated the growth of factions in Congress is the polarization of this country, which is more intense according to objective measures than at any time since just after the Civil War. Not since the Civil War has America been so divided uh, according to objective measures. In the 1960s, for example, there was a 50% overlap between the most conservative Democrats and the most liberal Republicans in Congress, today there is no such overlap. And as a result, the Madisonian deliberation and compromise that the framers thought was crucial to allowing Congress to function has disappeared. And the major congressional achievements of the past two administrations, the Affordable Care Act under President Obama and the Tax Act of President Trump, all were rammed through on party line votes with no votes from the opposite party. So this polarization is the central cause of the fracturing of America into geographic and virtual filter bubbles and echo chambers. The causes of the polarization itself are complicated. They include geographic self-sorting so that red and blue America live in completely different geographic areas and virtual self-sorting on a social media where people consume completely different uh, news universes and are unable to hear the arguments on the other side, as well as the transformation of Congress through partisan gerrymandering and the decline of what's known as regular order so that uh, you used to have to put bills through committees. Now party leadership can ram it through without consulting the other side. So that's the transformation of Congress. Now let's think about the executive branch. I can say again in a completely nonpartisan spirit that the idea of tweeting presidents would have appalled James Madison. <laughs> and I can say that both because our current president was not the first tweeter, President Obama started the first Twitter account, um, and also because Madison says in Federalist 10 that direct communication between the people and 
uh, the chief executive is uh, to be avoided because of the danger of demagoguery. That was why the presidency was conceived as a constitutional office. The last constitutionalist president was that underappreciated hero, uh, William Howard Taft. <laughs> I was assigned to write about Taft as part of the American President series as a homework assignment from Sean Wilentz, the, the editor of the series, and came through you know, this, this assignment to learn that Taft, who pined above all to be Chief Justice of the United States and eventually achieved his dream uh, 10 years after his uh, unwanted presidency, approached every decision as president in constitutional terms. Unlike Theodore Roosevelt, who said the president could do anything the Constitution didn't forbid, Taft said the president could only do what the Constitution allowed. And Taft tried to put Roosevelt's activist executive orders on firm constitutional grounds by persuading Congress to enact them. He withdrew more land for environmental protection than Roosevelt and brought more antitrust suits against Roosevelt. But this precipitated a break with Roosevelt, who ran for president in 1912 on the claim that the president was a steward of the people, who a direct channel of popular will. And Wilson, the other opponent in the election of 1912, also insists on a plebiscitory presidency where the president directly represents the people. And Roosevelt and, to a degree, Wilson are calling for the people to overturn judicial decisions by popular vote. They're endorsing progressive uh, uh, initiatives and referendum which allow for the direct expression of popular passions. This appalls the constitutionalist president who fears the end of Madisonian deliberation and he runs for president on the platform that slow Madisonian deliberation requires popular will to be filtered. As you can imagine, this is not a recipe for electoral success. <laughs> he, he wins only two states. It's an ignominious defeat, but it's completely fascinating to read Taft's poignant speeches denouncing Roosevelt and Wilson as populist demagogues. And now liberals as well as conservatives are rediscovering the virtues of a constrained presidency that is unable to appeal directly to the people in demagogic terms. Then we come to the federal courts. And we'll think in a moment together about how the Supreme Court may confront the constitutional questions that are about to uh, confront it, uh, involving conflicts between the presidency and Congress. Uh, and it is wrong to say that there was no polarization at the time of the framing. In the election of 1800, the outgoing Federalist reduced the size of the Supreme Court in order to deny the incoming Jeffersonian Republicans the right to make any appointments and the size of the court was further changed during the Civil War for political reasons. So the current call by Democrats to uh, increase the size of the court to 13 members if they win the presidency and the White House has historical precedent. But it is fair to say that the first chief, not the first chief, the th th uh, third chief, the great chief, John Marshall, made it his mission to persuade the court to converge around narrow unanimous opinions and by allowing the court to speak in one voice raise the prestige and legitimacy of the court to a degree to where it was fully able to check the presidency and Congress. And the spectacle of a court where five Republicans are divided against four Democrats uh, is one that we have not seen so directly in our history. The current chief, John Roberts, is acutely sensitive to this challenge, and he has said that he wants to make it his mission as chief to persuade the court to avoid these five to four rulings. During one of the great uh, privileges of my journalistic career, I interviewed Chief Justice Roberts at the beginning of his term. It was 2006. I was writing a book for a PBS series on the Supreme Court. It had the incredibly creative title, The Supreme Court. <laughs> And Roberts is a PBS fan, so he sat down with me to talk about his vision for the kind of court that he hoped to lead. And he said, apologies to you, Professor Rosen, but uh, law professors have made terrible justices over the course of time, and they've been really ineffective as chief justice, too, because they're so ideological and they're so devoted to their own correct interpretation, rather than thinking of the team dynamic. Roberts said he hoped it would be said of his decisions that a majority of them showed a concern about judicial legitimacy. And he cited as his model the great chief John Marshall, noting that Marshall had persuaded his colleagues to live together in the same boarding house where they discussed cases over a hogshead of Marshall's favorite case, uh, uh, Madeira. And uh, all the justices would get buzzed and all the cases were unanimous. 
there was the unfortunate moment, of course, when the justices voted uh, only to drink Madeira when it rained. Uh, Marshall looked out the window and said, our jurisdiction is so broad, it must be raining somewhere. <laughs> but I'm bummed. More, more Madeira and more unanimity. So, so, so Roberts said, you know, I'm not comparing myself to Marshall, but I think that it's important in this polarized time that people think of the court as something beyond five uh, Republicans against four Democrats. And uh, he acknowledged that his success would turn on his willing, the willingness of his colleagues to embrace his vision. Now, this was 2006 when we talked, and Robert said, who do you think will be most opposed to my vision or you know, be the greatest obstacle to this vision of, uh, of unan unanimity? And I was anxious and you know, I was talking to the chief and I couldn't think of it, but you're relaxed uh, now, even without Madeira. So 2006, which justice would be most opposed to narrow unanimous opinions? Scalia seems like, I hear Scalia and Thomas, both great guesses. Scalia seems like an example of the law professor who, uh, you know, my way or the highway. And uh, uh, Scalia also was extremely funny. And there was some survey of the wittiest justices judged by the number of laughs in the courtroom. Uh, this is what summer associates and law firms have to do over the summers, <laughs> count out the number of laughs. And, you know, he's very caustic and, he, uh, and uh, it was so influential in pushing his version of originalism. So Scalia sounds like an excellent guess, but it, it, it's not Scalia. And Thomas also is an excellent guess because Thomas was an even more ardent originalist than Scalia. Scalia said of Thomas, the difference between me and Thomas is that he would overturn any decision he thinks was wrongly decided or inconsistent with original understanding. I, Scalia, wouldn't do that because I'm not a nut. <laughs> and he meant that as a sort of compliment to his friend, Justice Thomas. So that's a good guess, but it's not, it's not Thomas. All right, we have a few more guesses and we have a lot more uh, stuff together. Justice Ginsburg, I hear Justice Ginsburg and, and uh, Justice Kennedy. Justice Ginsburg is my, I have a special place in my heart for Justice Ginsburg. We have been friends for 30 years. My next book is Conversations with RBG. And we're collecting the, our, collect, our conversations over the past 30 years. And it's just, we bonded over opera 30 years ago when I was a law clerk on the US Court of Appeals. And the great Justice Ginsburg, the notorious RBG, appointed as a judge's judge and respected by liberals and conservatives for her measured motions has become the fiery voice of liberalism and the hero of young women and young men and people and, and, and progressives everywhere because of her passionate defense of uh, liberty and equality. So that sounds like a great guess because she's such an icon and a prophet, but it's not RBG. The correct answer is Justice Kennedy and, and, and that, that's great that you called it out. And the reason that Justice Kennedy was uh, the biggest obstacle is because Justice Kennedy believed in broad defenses of liberty. The tie goes to liberty was the name of a biography of Justice Kennedy. When Justice Kennedy believed liberty was implicated, he would vote for the liberal side if it involved marriage equality or uh, even affirming the heart of Roe v. Wade, or with the conservative side, would it involve the Affordable Care Act, which he thought as a coercive uh, offense to liberty, or affirmative action. So he was a principled libertarian, but he was not in favor of narrow unanimous opinions. He wanted sweeping defenses of liberty and autonomy. So the central question with Justice Kennedy having retired is, is there a greater chance that Roberts might be able to persuade his conservative colleagues to join Justices Kagan and Breyer, who were pragmatists and who were passionately committed to this vision of nonpartisan legitimacy, and avoid these five to four splits? Now, much of that will turn on our new Justice Kavanaugh. And Justice Kavanaugh, uh, before he was appointed, um, I, many suggested, well, I'll just say that uh, Ken Starr came to the National Constitution Center, uh, whatever it was, two days ago, I, uh, and he worked with Brett Kavanaugh on the Independent Counsel uh, investigation. And he said, I think that Justice Kavanaugh will be with Chief Justice Roberts. He says he is, Less, not an, as much of an originalist as Justice Thomas or even Justice Gorsuch, that he is passionately committed to legitimacy, that he wants to be a justice for all the people, as he said in his statement at the White House uh, where he was uh, sworn in, and that uh, he shares Roberts' commitment to legitimacy. So we'll see. 
Um, but uh, everything will turn on the willingness of Justice Kavanaugh and of the other justices to avoid these five to four splits, either by not hearing the really controversial cases or by deciding them narrowly rather than broadly in ways that the liberal justices can agree on. So to give you an example, the court has just agreed to hear a case about whether you have to take down a World War I cross in Maryland that's been up since World War I, which ended uh, on November 11th, 1918. And uh, I am just gonna hazard a guess that it'll go up to the Supreme Court and there could, will be a lopsided decision in favor of maintaining the cross Justices Sotomayor and Ginsburg might dissent, but I think Kagan and Breyer may well join the majority in saying the cross can stay on the grounds that it's historical and it's in Maryland on a certain traffic circle at, uh, you know, t t next to uh, on this meridian. Uh, basically, the decision will be so narrowly crafted that it'll just apply to this cross and it won't have a sweeping rule that it'll apply to all monuments. And that is an example of a pragmatic decision that can bring both sides together. And Roberts will try to push for that kind of decision, and it'll be crucial to uh, determining how polarized the court's gonna be. All right, now to the question that we're all here to discuss, which is what is going to happen uh, with the future of the United States of America? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know that any more than you do, but I can set some of the constitutional questions that may arise. So imagine we have a new attorney general, an acting attorney general, whose name is Matthew Whitaker. And he said in an interview last year that he thinks that there is no collusion and the Trump, the investigation should, Mueller investigation should not examine the president's finances. And in fact, since a federal statute gives the attorney general control over the funding of the investigation, then perhaps the funding should be shut off and the investigation should be closed down. So imagine hypothetically, and this is just a law professor's hypothetical, that the acting attorney general turns off the funding for the Mueller investigation and tries to close it down. And then and also imagine that the uh, Mueller uh, files a report with the AG as he's required to do, but the AG refuses to share it with Congress. So there's no more money and the report is being sat on by the AG. Imagine that the Democrats in the House led by Henry Waxman, uh, subpoena the report and demand that Mueller testify. And imagine that the president exerts executive privilege and says that Mueller is not allowed to testify. What happens? Not so clear. Uh, Eric Holder refused to testify during the, the gun uh, dispute about uh, guns on the border and uh, asserting executive privilege and Congress didn't press it and he wasn't forced to testify. And I just learned coming over here from our constitutional prep team at the National Constitution Center that there's a case from the 1920s after the Teapot Dome scandal where Congress, Calvin Coolidge fires the uh, Harding's Attorney General Henry Doherty for not bringing antitrust investigations and Congress wants to know why Doherty didn't uh, bring these investigations. So they subpoena Doherty's brother and uh, the Supreme Court holds that yes, Congress does have the ability to issue subpoenas for matters that are relevant to doing its legislative functions, but not for general fishing expeditions. And since this was the brother and Congress might conceivably pass laws about antitrust, then the subpoena was upheld, but it might not be if it were the Attorney General himself. And then the Nixon case says that the courts can issue a subpoena to the president, but doesn't say whether Congress can. So it's an open question, and most of the case law on the Supreme Court is pretty pro-executive power, and this is not just a Democratic, uh, or rather a Republican thing. Uh, Democrats have been fierce in defending executive power when Democrats are in office, as President Obama's broad use of executive orders showed. And the central case was written by my uh, new hero, William Howard Taft. It's the case on executive power called the Myers case. And it broadly says the president has broad authority to fire any official that he appoints and that Congress cannot interfere with his ability to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. So you can imagine some serious 
standoffs. Some of it would go up to the court. Some of it, the court might refuse to decide uh, on the grounds that it's a political question where the court is not supposed to interfere with disputes between the two branches that are not susceptible to clear constitutional resolution. And we're in completely open territory. So we can continue to game out and think about some of the possible clashes. But I just want you tonight, I guess my charge to you, is as you think about these questions, please do not just be guided by your partisan passions. If you're a Democrat, don't assume that the Democrats can do whatever they want in Congress because they, you know, they, when they tried that uh, under President Obama, often Democrats were on the other side. And similarly, if you're a Republican, you know, don't assume the president can do whatever he likes because we have a constitutional system that is set up with some clear rules and some that are not so clear and uh, there are norms and we must, it's crucially important that we maintain this allegiance to the rule of passion, of, rather of reason rather than passion. The last thing I wanna say before talking with uh, you and, and getting your questions is how challenging it is to think through these questions in the age of Facebook and Twitter. This is the valley, I've, I'm always, I love coming out here because it's so beautiful and because if you wanna understand the nature of Madisonian media today, the place you go is not to the National Constitution Center on Independence Mall across from Independence Hall with the rarest original copies of the Constitution, <laughs> although I want you to come there, of course, and also sign on online, but you go to Facebook or Google because they're, the people there, those, uh, young kids in flip-flops and t-shirts have more to say over the future of free speech and privacy than any king or president or Supreme Court justice. And the fact that posts on Facebook based on fake news rather than real news travel faster and further than thoughtful deliberation in, posted in The Atlantic by David Brooks is a sign of the Madisonian nightmare. And Facebook has a new commission set up trying to examine the question of how to resurrect uh, real news and has come up with simple fixes. Facebook is choosing to privilege on its news feed posts that people actually read. So, you know, people tend to share really explosive posts without reading them. And Facebook creepily knows whether you've read a post uh, or not. Bad for privacy, but good, I guess, for Madisonian deliberation because by <laughs> privileging only the posts that people read, it's a small effort to slow down deliberation and force us to think twice before sharing. So that's what we must do. We must take a deep breath. We must educate ourselves before we form an opinion. We cannot have an informed opinion until we've heard the arguments on both sides. I'm a, I do this for a living. You can tell I'm very enthusiastic about it, but I don't know what to think about these questions that are arising every day until I do my homework and I go to the interactive constitution and I listen to scholars on both sides and I read the case law so that I can make up my mind. So you have a duty as citizens to engage in the arduous task of civic education. You must educate yourself about these issues so that we can preserve the future of freedom. And you have a duty, of course, to educate our children about it and to teach them about the structures of government so that they too will adhere to the future of democracy. Very alarming polls by Yasha Monk suggest that young people are more likely to support authoritarian alternatives to democracy than we older folks and are less willing to adhere to the principles like separation of powers and checks and balances. However, young people who are educated in the science of government, as George Washington called it, in calling for a national university devoted to the science of government, are more likely to support independent courts, judicial review, and to oppose the overturning of judicial decisions by popular votes. So civic education is not a luxury. It is crucial to the future of the Republic. And I am confident that as long as we the people take the time to educate ourselves about this great document of human freedom that unites us, liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, then the future of liberty will in fact be secure. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And tonight of all nights, it's really wonderful to hear your views. Um, appreciate you coming out here and sharing it with us. It's great to hear. So we have uh, many, many questions from the audience. So there, um, I'm just gonna do the best I can to uh, get through as many as we can. Um, you mentioned uh, the subpoena power, uh, the congressional subpoena power and how far that could go in, in compelling presidential testimony. 
Um, if that uh, issue came before the Supreme Court as it's currently configured, how do you think it would break? So US, Nixon, US v. Nixon is the main case. US v. Nixon was unanimous in saying that the uh, courts could compel the president to turn over the tapes. I would have thought that Nixon was uncontroversial. At one point in his career, Brett Kavanaugh, then Judge Kavanaugh, questioned US v. Nixon and said, this may be heresy to say, but maybe Nixon was wrongly decided. But in his confirmation hearings, he unequivocally embraced the Nixon case. So I'm gonna assume there are uh, you know, an overwhelming majority for Nixon, but Congress is not the court. So the, there the question is whether uh, the subpoena is related to some legislative function or not. And a subpoena purely designed to um, uh, investigate uh, perform a investigative function that is delegated to the executive, I suppose a, a real strict constructionist might distinguish from this Doherty case. So I, I have to read Doherty more closely, but I guess I would say that the bulk of opinion is in favor of Congress's ability to subpoena relevant information uh, that could be relevant to a legislative function. And since Congress is now considering whether or not to pass a law insulating the special counsel from being fired easily, you could make a case that many subpoenas would be held. So you can, you can tell that I, I'm not confident, but, uh, I, I, but there'll be a great Supreme Court decision that will arise from that. You know, it's, it's interesting. We do have uh, left and right justices today. Um, on the other hand, this will be a purely constitutional question of the, of the power of the president. Do you think that we will have some surprises coming out of the Supreme Court when they decide this issue? The, the uh, Justices Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, as well as their conservative colleagues are deeply committed to the structural constitution and the separation of powers. And I have no doubt that if they felt that the president was exceeding his constitutional bounds, they would immediately rein him in. So if the president tried to throw a journalist in jail, it would be you know an easy nine to zero decision. Uh, these constitutionalists, these structuralist justices, also think that Congress has important checking powers, just as Senator Ben Sass, uh, the constitutionalist in the Senate, has been saying Congress isn't doing its job and should be checking the president more aggressively. I think if Congress actually started to do that, then the Supreme Court would enthusiastically support it. Uh, the Constitution Center has a great commission co-chaired by Chris Coons of Delaware and Mike Lee of Utah, both great constitutionalists who think that Congress should do its job. So this might be a bipartisan function that certainly the House and, and maybe even the Senate could converge around. And broadly, I do not believe that this Supreme Court will let the president do whatever he wants because he's President Trump. They will approach it in structural terms. And if they think that the president's exceeding his assigned bounds, then they'll ram in. You know, uh, I did get a question about uh, Supreme Court recusal and whether um, Justice Kavanaugh's statement that the Democrats are out to get him is sufficient to require him to recuse when it comes to questions of presidential power. For better or for worse, the recusal standards for justices is basically to toothless. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has exempted itself from the uh, recusal and ethical standards that bind other federal judges and both Democratic and uh, Republican justices have been criticized for failure to recuse. My dear friend and hero, Justice Ginsburg, you know, created some controversy and I later apologized for criticizing the president and saying she was gonna move to Australia if he won. And uh, <laughs> conservatives called on her to recuse herself from Trump related cases and she refused. So the bottom line there is I think he will not recuse himself and will not be forced to. Yeah. Um, the, um, I've got a number of questions about uh, the press and the First Amendment and the uh, unprecedented attack on the press by our sitting president. Um, is, are there ways that this will get in front of the Supreme Court? And if so, uh, what would be their views on the press and First Amendment rights? There's such a beautiful bipartisan consensus in favor of the First Amendment principle 
that speech in America can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. That is the principle that came from Justice Louis Brandeis's great dissent concurring opinion in the Whitney case from 1927. Read it, please, uh, to inspire yourself about the roots of the American First Amendment. It was reaffirmed by the Supreme Court in the 60s, and I think you've got nine to zero decisions against the president if he tried to act formally against journalists. There is a case bubbling up about whether the president can block people from his Twitter account. Uh, and it turned, you know, it sounds uh, silly, but it's important. And the question is, is his Twitter account a public forum or not? It's a pro uh, supposedly it's his personal account, but it's where he communicates with the public. And, uh, you know, I could see a lopsided, dis already a federal judge has ruled against the president, and that could be a lopsided decision. There's also, um, you know, really important, so, so on, on, on speech, but there are harder questions about whether the president can remove security clearances of his critics and whether he can retaliate against them in more subtle ways. And those are a little bit closer. I think, though, that, that if he acts in any formal ways against journalists, you're, you're just going to get a, a unanimous decision against him. Uh, there's also been a number of questions about... Um the president's assertion that by executive order he can do away with uh, citizenship birth rights yes. um, under the 14th Amendment. Uh, what's your view on that? I'm smiling because we just did a podcast uh, two days ago with Akhil Amar, my dear law professor, uh, who taught me first year constitutional law and kindled my love of the Constitution, and Edward Erler, who's one of the leading people on the other side, saying that the president can do it away. So I'm gonna now sum up, because I know them, the best arguments on both sides. Erler and Amar agreed the president cannot do it by executive order. Erler, the conservative, thinks that Congress has plenary power over immigration and naturalization and has delegated no authority to the president to make decisions on his own and indeed has passed a series of statutes seeming to assume birthright citizen by ship by granting social security numbers, for example, to everyone born in the United States, whether to legal or illegal uh, aliens as parents. So Erler thinks the president cannot do it by executive order. However, Erler believes that Congress could eliminate birthright citizenship by statute. Amara disagrees, and I can say that the overwhelming consensus of liberal and conservative scholars is with Amar and not Erler. From Michael McConnell, who teaches out here at Stanford, to John Yoo at Berkeley, the Bush OLC uh, guy, uh, all agree with Amar, to Stephen Calabresi, the head of the Federalist Society, the, that Congress can't eliminate birthright citizenship, and here are the reasons. Okay, this is a little wonky, but it's, it's a great example of a constitutional question that, uh, you know, the, the, the answer is more clear than not. So the 14th Amendment says, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. What does it mean to be subject to the jurisdiction thereof? Well, the framers stood up in Congress when they proposed the 14th Amendment 150 years ago and said, the only people not subject to the jurisdiction thereof are the children of foreign ambassadors who have allegiance to foreign kings and potentates and Indians not taxed, as they called it in the locution of the day. That is Native Americans on uh, land that was not formally subject to federal jurisdiction. Someone stood up and said, does this mean that the child of a a Chinese immigrant will be entitled to citizenship, and uh, a senatorial proponent of the amendment said, absolutely. And the whole point of the amendment was to overturn the Dred Scott decision, which infamously said that African Americans, all even born in the United States, could not be citizens of the United States and had no rights which white people were born to respect. And that ahistorical and illiberal decision was repudiated by the first sentence of the 14th Amendment. This understanding was affirmed in the Wong Kim Ark case of 1898, which assumed that the child of a Chinese immigrant was a citizen and has been repeatedly reaffirmed by Supreme Court decisions in the 1980s, uh, including the Plyler and Doe decision. Uh, so for all these reasons, I would predict if it got up to the court it would be an easy win that the president can't do it by executive order and a lopsided, uh, if, not, if, if not unanimous, ruling that even Congress cannot eliminate birthright citizenship. It's there nice we go. No, know that not everything's gray, <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> 
Uh, you talked about uh, the decision today, uh, President, to uh, change out our Attorney General. Um, and uh, I've gotten a number of questions about kind of the implications that might flow from that, depending on where this goes. Um, uh, what would be um, your view of the alternatives of the House uh, as a matter of separation of powers um, if, uh, for example, President Trump decided to fire Mueller directly or to completely undercut his ability to uh, carry out the investigation currently going on? So the House can always, uh, you know, I, I sort of played out the hypothetical at the beginning of, which you're saying might not be a hypothetical, of compelling Mueller's testimony and requiring him to turn over whatever he's already produced. And that would lead to executive privilege issues, as well as to questions about the scope of Congress's authority to subpoena. But Congress might win those battles. I think it's not open, I'm not confident, but there'd be a decent chance. Then Congress could uh, forbid, uh, you, you could create an alternative funding mechanism. The, the statute that allows uh, the Attorney General to defund Mueller could be rewritten or the federal regulation could be overturned by a statute. So Congress could change that, but of course you need both houses to do it. So the House couldn't do that on its own. Then the House can also conduct its own investigations. And we've seen again and again from Watergate through Oliver North, through Clinton, the spectacle of parallel investigations, including Congress granting its own immunity to uh, get out the facts on its own. That's dangerous when you've got an ongoing investigation because as we learned in the North case, when Congress immunizes witnesses, they may taint their testimony in ways that makes future convictions uh, impossible. Uh, but if you're not concerned about creating court cases because the investigation has been shut down, then Congress can basically conduct a parallel investigation and using publicly available information as you just call all the witnesses before Congress and get the facts itself. However, I think the bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that the real uh, authority that the Congress has against the president is indeed impeachment. And I want to recommend to you a uh, I mean, there were a series of good impeachment books out recent, uh, recently, <laughs> just for, for, for your light summer reading, for some quiet fun, you know, on the SEPTA as you're coming in. And uh, Joshua Matz and Lawrence Tribe have a book out which really talk about the fact that the framers saw it as a political remedy. They did not think it should be confined merely to crimes. If the president were to go to France and refuse to do his job, that would be impeachable dereliction of duty. But they did, And they also didn't think that all crimes should be impeachable. A, tra a traffic ticket doesn't qualify. It has to be serious corruption or crimes against the state. We did have an amazing podcast. This was a really great one on treason. Who would have thought that, I mean, that sounds really cool, but it turns out it's very technical. Could the Russia allegations amount to treason? And it was amazing because the liberal flipped the conservative. The conservatives started off by thinking that it wasn't treason. The requirement is you need uh, adherence to an enemy of the United States and either an open confession or two witnesses. And the liberal argued that although at the time of the framing, you had to be at war with the foreign power in order for it to qualify as an enemy. Now, something like cyber war could qualify as a foreign enemy, so, if, so Russia might qualify. And if the president merely said, you know, I uh, withdrew the sanctions because I thought they were unfair, that by itself would qualify as a confession of helping Russia, which could qualify as treason. So all this is to say that it's not at all implausible that you could get facts that would come close to the core of what the framers conceived of as an impeachable offense since they were centrally concerned with uh, domestic corruption or adherence to foreign enemies. But it would be a political judgment and then you come up with a reality that you know, the Senate would have to convict. And in, right now there's nothing close to a two thirds majority in the Senate to convict. So ultimately, it's a political judgment that uh, Waxman said yesterday, before the, right after the election results, that the Democrats were not planning to resort to impeachment uh, at all, lightly, that they wanted to govern first. But if Trump fired Mueller and the facts came out and it really looked like adherence to Russia, then bless you, I could imagine, bless all of us, if that, if that happened. 
I could, you know, the Democrats might impeach. And then the, then the question is, is there a scenario under which the facts would be so dramatic that the Senate would convict? And if it, what would it take? What would the smoking gun tape emerge, you know, Vladimir, I, w I will openly adhere to you by granting our cyber secrets, <laughs> yeah. fake fake news, you know, but any, anything's possible with that. Stage. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Would, uh, I had a couple people suggest that the House, if Mike Mueller gets fired, the House should just hire him and set him up in his own investigation. What would you think about that? Well, I think the president could still assert executive privilege and there would be constraints on what he would be allowed to chair based on what he previously owned, and I, I don't think he would and it do it for easy. those reasons. Yeah, <laughs> nice stuff, though. Um, we've seen uh, unprecedented intervention by uh, the Congress and the President into the inner workings of the Department of Justice. Uh, we've always historically had a view that there should be independence of the Department of Justice, uh, particularly for criminal investigations. Uh, what are the constitutional underpinnings for that? Is that just precedent, or is there is there uh, are there is it possible that there might be a constitutional bar to keep the president from interfering? No, it really is a norm. Uh, Madison passed a statute allowing the president to fire the Secretary of State or people in the State Department <laughs> because of a concern of the unitary control over the executive branch. Wonking out here on the way over, I learned that a couple of presidents have basically pressured their attorneys generals to resign, although not explicitly fired them, from Truman, who was upset with Attorney General McGrath for an investigation that embarrassed him, to Ulysses Grant, who pressured out an attorney general. Uh, and the norm of an apolitical Justice Department is a relatively recent innovation that stemmed from Edward Levy, who was Gerald Ford's attorney general and the former dean of of Chicago, I think. And Ford had a very nonpartisan view of the Justice Department in light of his experience in Watergate. Uh, you know, and of course we have the Kennedy example of appointing his brother because he thought he needed some legal experience. <laughs> so, um, uh, so these are norms and they're fragile and they are being severely tested. But the last time it was really tested, the Saturday Night Massacre did um, prompt uh, the beginnings of the political consensus for impeachment, although it took the smoking gun of the July tape where the president is ordering obstruction to solidify that consensus. And, and the, just the real sticking point is, are, are we so polarized? Are, are red and blue camps so dug in that neither will listen to facts and mm -hmm. evidence? And that remains to be seen. What would be your recommendation uh, to the country to start to solve that problem? To learn about the Constitution. I told you what my recommendation is. <laughs> and to learn about history, too. Isn't it fa Look, uh, this is such, these are such interesting times, friends. I, I didn't know about Attorney General uh, Doherty or the Truman president until uh, hours ago coming over here. There, there, there is so much history to learn, and it is... It is. I, I suppose it's. I suppose it's. Re, I suppose it's reassuring to to realize that there's a framework for the discussions. We've come through terrible times before. That we we fought a civil war mm -hmm. over the aching stain of slavery, and 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 the country almost came apart. But what's so inspiring about times like that is how the Constitution provides a vocabulary for unity. So there's this amazing moment that I again struck me. Uh, Sean Wilentz has a new book about slavery and the Constitution. And it turns out that Madison in the convention stood up and quoting the philosopher David Hume said, it is again contrary to natural right that there be property in, in, in men and therefore the Constitution will not take a position about whether or not slavery is or is not constitutional. So it was neither a pro-slavery and anti-slavery document. Madison's notes are forgotten for because they're not published. In 1840, they're published, and two people discover them. A young Abraham Lincoln finds Madison's notes and stands up at Cooper Union and, and makes that the basis for his statement that the Constitution cannot authorize slavery because it takes no position on whether there's bondage in men. And Frederick Douglass also reads it as a, as a, as a, 
as an abolitionist, and he says he sees the Constitution and conceives of himself as a citizen for the first time and quotes Madison's language in repudiating his former view, the Garrisonian view, that the Constitution is a pro-slavery document and insisting that, in fact, it leaves the question up to the people of the United States. So it just is so unifying to realize that these principles inspire and bind us, and all we have to do is learn about them in order to find a way forward. Thank you for that. That's great. I also got a number of questions on what you think the Supreme Court is going to do with the abortion question. Uh, certainly the populace uh, is currently in favor of retaining Roe versus Wade. Um, uh, there's been, of course, a lot of uh, debate between the conservative and liberal perspectives on this issue. Uh, what do you think this court will do with it? I asked RBG that question, and you have to wait till next fall when the book is out to find out what she said, <laughs> although she's probably talking about it. A lot of people are asking her. But it's not a secret that you know, lots of people are asking about it. And the Federalist Society, which is the group of conservative lawyers, was recently polled about whether they thought Roe would be overturned, and they overwhelmingly th thought Roe would not be formally overturned, that Chief Justice Roberts who is so concerned about institutional legitimacy, who knows that Roe was reaffirmed uh, in the Casey case, uh, would not want to see a five to four decision overturning something that's so embedded in the culture, but that Roe will be, so, will be severely cut back, I mean, essentially gutted. And I asked Justice Ginsburg, and many people have, about you know, what would happen if it's gutted. And she said the main effect will be felt by poor women who yeah. right now do not the have... States. The red states. Yeah. But they do not have much access to choice right now. You have to travel very far in a red state to the nearest clinic, and uh, that access will be further cut off if Roe is overturned. But that's... But, you know, it'll, there'll be no change in San Francisco or in New York. Because remember, if Roe is overturned, abortion becomes neither legal nor illegal. It just... Each, each state can decide on its own how much to protect or restrict abortion. So the blue states will continue to support it, and all of the action will be in funding, and pro-choice advocates should devote their attention right now to ensuring that women in red states can travel to blue states to exercise their right to choose. Yeah. I also got a couple of questions on Citizens United. Uh, if, if that should come before the court in some format, what do you think would happen? Well, the real question now is not, will it be overturned, which it certainly will not be for the foreseeable future, but will it be extended so that all restrictions on campaign uh, expenditures as well as contributions are overturned? The Buckley versus Vallejo case drew this Talmudic distinction between expenditures, which are limitable, and uh, God, I can never get it right because it's not intuitive. Contributions can be limited because of the appearance of corruption, but expenditures cannot be because they're a kind of expression. So you have up to four, and we'll see what Justice Kavanaugh says, possibly five votes for saying both contributions and expenditures have to be unlimited, and that would open the floodgates even more. more. Yes. Hmm. So the only remedy to that is a constitutional amendment. Uh, so then we're into constitutional convention land. Is it conceivable that we could see a Citizens United Amendment or any kind of amendment? So 27 states have called for a balanced budget amendment. They've called for a convention of the states, which is a rarely, in fact, never before used provision that would, on the application of two thirds of the uh, state legislatures, require Congress to call a constitutional convention for a balanced budget amendment. If uh, seven more states join, then you'd have such a convention. And then it's conceivable the convention could propose a balanced budget amendment, or it could go rogue and could propose a Citizens United Amendment or anything it likes, because a convention, by definition, cannot be limited by the terms of its summoning. Remember, the Constitutional Convention itself was illegal in 1787, according to the rules of the Articles of Confederation, which required unanimous approval of all the states. So quick vote, because it's an, we've done these debates at the Constitution Center. Knowing that a constitutional convention could go rogue and propose anything it likes, although any amendment that it proposed would have to be ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures, who supports 
a constitutional convention? And who opposes it? Not everyone was voting, but that was a majority against. And generally, when people think about the possibility that the convention could go rogue, they tend to oppose it. So that suggests that we're not going to get a convention to overturn Citizens United. And we may see even fewer restrictions on campaign funding than we do now. Wow. Hmm. Wow, indeed. <laughs> also, a couple of questions on the Second Amendment and gun rights. Yes. Um, obviously, there's been, uh, again, some kind of polarized debate in the country that uh, Second Amendment rights trump everything, and others saying that uh, at the time the Second Amendment was, was passed, people had muskets but not AR-15s. Um, what would you say uh, is, is the constitutional basis for, uh, for guns in this country? What, what does the Constitution require? Let's consult the interactive Constitution. <laughs> What's so cool about this is it's so nonpartisan. So even for the, I have to take out my constitutional reading glasses for this. <laughs> even the Second Amendment, the most contested of all provisions, we have the leading liberal and conservative scholars on the Second Amendment, <laughs> Nelson Lund and Adam Winkler, with a thousand word statement about what they agree the Second Amendment means. So it's like a unanimous Supreme Court majority opinion. Every word in this statement is accepted by both sides. So you can bank on it being uh, accepted. So here's what Winkler and Lund have to say about the core meaning of the Second Amendment. Implicit in the debate between Federalists and Anti-Federalists were two shared assumptions. First, that the proposed new constitution gave the federal government almost total legal authority over the army and the militia. Second, that the federal government should not have any authority at all to disarm the citizenry. They disagreed only about whether an armed populace could adequately deter federal oppression. So both the liberal, Adam Winkler teaches out here at UCLA and Nelson Lund's at uh, George Mason, and they agree the framers are concerned about a tyrannical federal government disarming the citizenry, which is supposed to be able to defend liberty. Now, what do they think about assault weapons? Here, Winkler and Lund disagree. Lund said, Winkler, the liberal, says, well, they didn't think about assault weapons. There were none, but there were muskets, which were heavily regulated, and you had to submit them for public inspection, and uh, g weapons used for uh, military use uh, could be regulated uh, in the spirit of a well-regulated militia. And, L and Lund, the conservative, says it makes no sense to have bans on assault weapons because there's no discrete class of assault weapons that you can identify in advance. It's like calling French fries freedom fries. And therefore, because assault weapons are so ill-defined, the bans are unconstitutional. Every court to have considered the issue since the Supreme Court in the Heller decision declared Second Amendment rights to be an individual rights has upheld bans on assault weapons, as well as most other uh, regulations that are on the table. So if we have a gun control problem in this country, and I know many of you think that we do, and most citizens think that we do, it's not the fault of the Supreme Court. That Heller decision written by Justice Scalia said that all sorts of reasonable regulations from restrictions on guns at schools to those of gun possessions by felons were perfectly reasonable. We have a problem because the legislatures, state and Congress, can't pass and won't pass the regulations that those Parkland kids embraced and that most of the country supports. And that's a, I'm just stating the polls. I'm not, uh, it's a nonpartisan statement. So all this is to say, that, all this is to say that, um, don't focus your ire on the Supreme Court if you're concerned about gun control. Focus on lobbying your legislatures, on uh, uh, you know, funding uh, uh, the, the logjam, and on this terrible polarization and capture problem. Uh, I, the, the, the Supreme Court is likely to uphold any of the regulations that a majority of the country may indeed support. So unfortunately, we've reached the point where I have to ask you a last question. I um, hate to bring this to an end because it's been completely fascinating. Um, so let's say um, we've agreed we're not going to have a, a constitutional convention because it's too dangerous. But um, you're channeling Madison, and you have a magic wand, and you can change the Constitution in any way um, that you could. What would be the things that you would do?
the amendment that Madison thought would be most important, there were two that he really cared about. The first one would have prohibited the states as well as the federal government from abridging the freedom of speech conscience as the press. In other words, he wanted to incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states. That failed, but his hope was fulfilled after the 14th Amendment passed after the Civil War applied the Bill of Rights to the states. The second was a, uh, a, a, a legislative veto over hasty state laws. He was really afraid of the state mobs and wanted to have a greater cooling mechanisms. We've seen now that interestingly federalism has proved to be more of a cooling mechanism than Madison hoped and liberals as well as conservatives are converging around the idea that California should be a laboratory of democracy that should be able to reach different decisions than uh, Kansas or Arkansas. But what we do, what we desperately need are more cooling mechanisms, are ways of slowing things down. We, may, we cannot have Brexit in this country where people make fundamental constitutional decisions on, on one-off votes. And the answer may have to do with our media technologies more than with constitutional structures. So thinking about the regulation of the platforms and whether we need, a con the Constitution says Congress shall make no law, it doesn't say Mark Zuckerberg shall make no law. Do we need a constitutional amendment to regulate Facebook and Google? Madison, you asked me to channel Madison, he and Jefferson supported an amendment that would have prohibited Congress from establishing corporations with exclusive privileges. They were surprisingly uh, populist in their anti-corporate sentiment and we do not currently have a constitutional or even an antitrust vocabulary for thinking about regulations of the platforms. So if Madison were to return, I think he would be centrally concerned with what's going on here in Silicon Valley. Thank you so much for an incredible sort of words tonight. So our thanks to Jeff Rosen, President and CEO of the National Constitution Center and Professor of George Washington University Law School. We also thank everyone here as well as our audience on radio, television, and the internet. We want to remind everyone that Professor Rosen's book on Howard Taft, which I've already recommended, it's excellent, is for sale and he'll be pleased to sign copies in this room following the program. I'm Mary Cranston and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you are in the know, is adjourned. <laughs> Great. Love that. Love the gavel. <laughs> <laughs>